You're watching BBC Four. The next programme contains discriminatory language. Jamaica. See, I'm wearing my new clocks. Box fresh. The thing about Rodigan, he's a goddamn phenomenon, that geezer. Yeah, that's 40 years of broadcasting. All right, 40 years of being Mr. Consistent. This is genuine love for music. I am constantly amazed at the story of David Rodigan. That's the secret of his success, is just love and passion. For 40 fantastic years, I've been living, breathing and playing Jamaican music on the radio and live on stage. Lucky enough to be a DJ and privileged enough to be doing something that I absolutely love. And for the next 45 minutes, I'm going to take you on a musical journey. So make some noise! The record middle, very important. I've always loved the music because it touches my soul. It's impossible to resist. This is a kind of fever, this music, and there's no antidote. Al Capone guns don't argue. I actually don't know why, but I do know that from when I first heard Al Capone's guns don't argue, I was hooked. I couldn't let it go. It, it would never leave me. I'm still as fascinated by it now as I was then. From my earliest days as a DJ on Radio London to Capital Radio, Kiss FM and now on BBC One Extra and Radio 2, my obsession with the music of Jamaica has lasted for over 50 years. Reggae is my life. I don't care how much I'm down. When reggae starts to play, I'm happy and I feel good. Well, I remember when we go and we dance, dance, dance. You dance till daylight. Could go home anytime, any hours of the morning. And you, and you feel so good. Oh, yeah. And you oh, feel yeah. young again. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> You know, my parents are of the Windrush generation, and they came to this country, invited, by the way, to help rebuild it after the Second World War. And they brought their hopes, their dreams, and, most importantly, their precious record collections. And it was that that had really helped them to integrate and also ease their pain. I mean, they came here looking for the gold, but obviously didn't find it. And in those long, cold, dreary winter nights, it must have been music that just warmed them up and just gave them, gave them life. Rudy, a message to you, Rudy. A message to you. When you used to walk down the street, all the windows used to be open and you'd hear these songs blaring out of the windows. It was beautiful. We might be struggling, but just feel good with the sunshine and hearing those music. It reminds you feeling like they were back home. Because I remember the first time I went to Jamaica and I landed in Jamaica, I went, oh, it's like I'm, it's, I'm in Brixton. And what's beautiful about the English-British love affair with Jamaican culture is that it happened organically via the people, for the people, because of the people. You know, you know what I'm saying? It's a very, yeah, it's a testament to the power of culture. But socially, it was really interesting because um, ska music exploded into the UK and it wasn't just um, young Jamaicans and West Indians that got into this, they passed it on to uh, young white teenagers. And luckily there'd been this interesting legacy and history of white working class kids looking to particularly Jamaican music for their rebellious fix. So we're talking about, you know, the early 60s with the mods. 
and that's me. Living in a village just outside Oxford, born in Germany from a British military family, and just getting into a new sound with my friends. A sound that was brought to Oxford by West Indians drawn to the city by the prospect of work in the car factories. Colin Beastly Luca. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. How are you? How are you? Colin and I go back a long, long way. We're soul brothers. Yeah, we are. Colin's from Whitney, I'm from Kidlington. We were 15. We were all mods. Always in Always suits. Always in suits. Always in suits and ties. Always. Oxford Town Hall, me and BC Luca, we queued up here for hours to get in there. And it used to be packed on a Saturday night. Mm. I mean, we saw Winder K Frog in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Green, Green Door. Green Door. We Green saw door. the Joyce Bond review when yeah. she called me up on stage. Yeah, that's right. Um, and I was, that's I was right. like, do the teasy. Do the teasy. That's it. Do the teasy. Take it easy. Take it easy. Take it easy. No need to hurry. You'd have soul records being played, ska, rock, steady yes. records. A real mix up, wasn't it? These are the places that we gravitated to because that's where we could hear the music in context being played loud. And another thing you do, which would never be heard of today, if you bought some stuff, like we'd buy things that you knew nobody else had, you would take them to the dance. And you actually say to the, to the DJ, play that. And I remember um, somebody bringing a U Roy record to the stage club, and, but, and we were, what? We didn't know it was yeah. U Roy or yeah. anything, but was this guy talking over a rhythm? And they were going nuts. We never knew what they were saying. Yeah, that we was one sit of... for hours in Ronnie's bedroom saying, play that bit again, play I that know. bit again, until you got it. And, do you remember Forward and Fayaka, Manacle and Dengo Saka? Yeah. I still tell you, Forward and Fayaka, Manacle yeah. and Dengo Saka. What does that mean? And we went through hours trying to work that one out, didn't we? And the first Jamaican record I ever heard, My Boy Lollipop by Millie Small. I remember her singing this on Ready Steady Go, which was the show that everyone watched. It was live television on ITV, Friday evenings. And um, she sung it, handing out lollipops. And we all fell for her in a big way. We fell for this song. It went into the British hit parade. It became a massive pop single. It was so energized. That was the first thing that caught me. The beat, the sound, I, I was fascinated by it. It was danceable and, and it was collectible. The, the music drew people in. And the, the obvious examples of that are, uh, you know, uh, Israelites, Desmond Decker, 007. It became a part of British culture. Party music of Scar and Rocksteady started to turn into what we now know as reggae. And some of my favorite records are from this golden era. But as the music changed, so did the lyrical content, as the influence of Rastafari became more important. I mean, you've got to understand, you know, the whole Scar thing that my parents would have been so enamored with was this very kind of optimistic music. You know, it kind of created after the independence of Jamaica in 1962. So it was like all about, yeah, we've got to get some now. But as the years panned out, that's not how it, it, things worked out. And the mood on the island changed, and so did the music, you know, reflecting that social change. It got more militant, it got more politicised. And again, it was the perfect soundtrack to how pissed off we were right here in the UK. We'll carry on marching like a great army towards the Britain of our dreams! You, as a person, at that time in Great Britain, were the shit on the shoe of the country. You were an immigrant, you had the worst jobs, you were treated badly by the police, unfairly. You were in the poorest communities, you were in the poorest social housing. You know, in the playground at school, before the Powell speech, I was like, you know, Don, let's somebody's mate, and the next day I was a coon, gollywog, black bastard. And it happened like that. It flipped on a dime, man. Yeah, 
The teachers were barefaced back then as well. They just tell you, this is not for you. You should go home. Go home, go home to where? I was born here. That's a fact. I am British. I knew there was politics um, from a very young age to do with my skin colour and where I'm from. I knew why we huddled together in small communities. I realised it was to feel protected, I suppose, in one way. And I knew that there was this, this unfair treatment of us by the police. I was scared of the police as a kid and I never did anything wrong. It was a period of sus, which meant police could arrest you on the basis of suspecting you might do something. Me and Jim stand up waiting for a bus. Not causing no fuss. When all on a sudden a police van pull up. 99% of them were white and they used to call your names, uh, try to make you lose your temper to kick you in the back of the van. Just anything. And you're just walking down the road. And you know, some of, some of us were school kids and we were having hassle from the police. It made you realise your skin colour, you know, you were different. Just, you know, you knew you were different. Trust me, we didn't have a voice. Um, black people had no presence on television unless they were being in a comedy or it was jokes or it was racially inappropriate humour. It was really dispiriting, you know, before you even ventured into the wide world that you were this underdog and the only escapism for me was music. Men and people will fight you down when you see child Let me tell you if you're not wrong then everything is all right. You know, I've been around the world a few times and you'd think that the most recognised musical artist on the planet would be somebody like, I don't know, Beatles or Rolling Stones or Bob Dylan or whatever. But it's not. It's Bob Marley. Simply because why? There's more people of colour that are dispossessed and pissed off. Open your eyes and look within. And it's interesting in the 21st century that, you know, the Bob that most people are familiar with are this kind of one love, kind of happy vibe. Which was, it was one side of Bob, but that was by no means the totality of the man. I mean, you know, for most of the people on this planet, Bob's about get up, stand up. I'm standing outside what was once the Greyhound Pub, one of the premier music venues in London. Back in 1974, I'd come here to see the Wailers. When the concert started, I was confused and bemused because I couldn't see them. I just heard this boom, 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 this drumming. And then they stood up because Bob, Peter and Bunny had been playing the drums on the floor of the pub. A pub! And eventually the concert came to an end and I came out. I started to walk down Fulham Palace Road. In a shop doorway, I saw an enormous cloud of smoke. And when it cleared, it was Bob Marley on the end of a big one. Standing next to him was Wire Linda, the keyboard player. I literally rushed to the shop doorway and I said, Bob, yeah, I'm a big fan of the Soul Rebel album. It's an amazing concert. And he just smiled at me and said, yeah, man, you know. But it was just a few seconds. You know, it wasn't even a minute. And with that, a screecher breaks, a car pulled up at the side and he said, gotta go. And as the car pulled away, he turned and waved to me from the back window of the car. I was standing on the Fulham Palace Road on a hot summer's night in 1974. And not only did I meet Bob Marley, but he waved to me as he drove off. Follow that. I would listen to Bob Marley all day. I have all Bob Marley's records. Yes. Bob Marley been tears to my eyes sometimes. And I adore him. I love every one of his reggae songs. And I listen to all Bob Marley reggae until I drop asleep. <laughs> every Thursday to Friday, we used to buy the record. And when I don't remember the name, I used to go in Brixton Atlantic Road, where it was a record shop yeah, there. Yeah. 
I used to go there and sing it to it's them, the and they know exactly yeah, what I'm. So yeah. every Thursday almost mm -hmm. I buy a record. Uh -huh. Those are good days. Forty-five. Good yeah. I have seventy-five, yeah. and I have thirty-three. Yeah. And LP. Yeah. yeah. Keep buying my reggae music, and I'm not stopping because it makes me feel, you know, and I use it for my exercise. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As Marley's sound and the reggae world changed in the 1970s, I was working as a jobbing actor, but my love of the music never died. I spent most of the decade buying and selling records. On a Saturday, I would take records from Lewisham, which I was given by Lee at Lee Sound City, and I'd come up on a bus to Gloucester Green, and I'd either meet the sound boys who run sound systems at the bus garage, or I'd meet them in these gardens. And I'd have a box, a bag, a grip with pre-release records in from Jamaica. And they just, I said, this is a good one, this is a good one. And whether or not they would take it is up to them. And if they didn't like it, my deal was, you can give it back to me next week, I'll give you your money back. And that's how I supplied. And they did as well. And they did. And it was cool. Black Harmony Sound, all yep. those guys. Yep. And, and record collectors. I'd meet them here. When Roddy used to have his record store up in Blackbird Leeds, I used to go up there and what was laughingly referred to as help, which I just used to stand behind and dance, really, and just say, put that record on, Roddy, put that record on. The people would be four deep around this store, just rocking with this music. And the very last day we had the stall there, and you kept saying, this is the last tune, this is the last tune, and people would go, no, just one more, just one more. And we were stood there with tears streaming down our eyes. Do you remember that? Yeah. Because I it do. was a lot in the last all before. I mean, that was a highlight of my week. It was I didn't a highlight used, of my I week. I didn't used to go out on a Saturday night, so I'd be up early. To, and I wasn't never as early as him, so I could get there. I think, I think I remember the Oxford Mail doing a little article saying, Sunday mornings in Oxford rock, go to Blackbirdley's Market and look at this stall. <laughs> yeah. My customers demanded the best, and many of the greatest reggae records of that era were coming from just one label in Jamaica, the legendary Studio One, produced by the mighty Clement Cox and Dodd. There was only one place in the UK to get hold of these records, Peckins in West London. Ah, oh, really good. How you doing, Dave? How you? You all right? Um, on cue. On cue. Taking you back, memory lane. Undying love, Ernest Wilson. Yes, sir. Good morning to you. <laughs> Good morning, bright and early in Peckins. Right. I have to tell you that that right here, well, actually, in the original shop down yeah. the road, I first discovered it in 1976. I'd heard there was a shop called Peckins, where they sold exclusive Studio One records. Studio One for me was a very important label. It was the Tamla Motown of Jamaican music. So many of the great stars learned their craft or began to learn their began, craft in yeah. Studio One. Yeah. You know, and the list is long. Whalers, Bob Andy, Delroy Wilson, you know, Burning Spears, there's so many. I mean, and Cox wouldn't wholesale any records to no one else but my dad. He was the focal point. He had to go to Pekins to get it. So it was like a relationship that was built up from the 40s between them, having a sound together in Jamaica, him coming to London, 1960, and carried it on selling the records. Friday evening was the time, yeah. or Saturday morning when all these new pre-releases were in. So the counter would be packed, well, not just with sound men, but collectors, you know, people who are into the music. And whoever was working on that counter would play these songs. He wouldn't play them for very long. And there was a secret code going on. <laughs> all these winks and nods, and the guy behind the counter would like pick it up and put it down and, and put it on his pile, and then the other guy would go on his pile and say, oh, I'll take one as well. And, and then the other guy looks at him and says, like, why are you following me? There's arguments, because someone said, no, I did, I put my hand up. Did I get you one? No, man, you ain't going to get one. And other guys <laughs> would get special treatment, like Saxon would have their pile. <laughs> in a box. In a box. They were protective and possessive. Yeah. Because yeah. the music was everything. Yeah. My dad, he was a stern man. Um, but once he knew you loved something and you, was, you weren't a mess around, he was very accommodating. Peckins, I mean, here's the original exactly. logo, yeah. and there's the man himself, George Price. Um, 
And he taught me so much about the music, and, and then I got to know the family, and <laughs> then he started inviting me up for lunch on Sundays, <laughs> and Miss Gertie, his wife, <laughs> your yeah. mum, yeah. um, took me under her wing, so to speak. He was like a musical son to my dad. It was incredible how they embraced me. The fact that I was invited to lunch one Sunday was for me very special. But when I was told, you need to keep coming back because you're always welcome here, I was, well, obviously touched to say the least. I mean, there are so many things that I'm so grateful to you and your family for because of introductions that were made. You know, to climb the stairs at Treasure Isle, to go to Cox and Dodd and to be welcomed into the inner sanctum by the man himself. <laughs> who I first met in your front room in 1976. You know, Mr. Dodd's very reserved, very shy man, a man of few words, right? Yeah. Could I have a, a picture, Mr. Dodd? And he said, OK. I stood there to have the picture taken next to him, and then suddenly he put his arm around me. And you can see in that photograph the look on my face, because I have got Cox and Dodd, the original Cox and Clement Seymour Dodd, the original sound system man from Jamaica. He's put his arm around me. That photograph is one yes, of my most treasured yes, possessions. Fantastic. At this point, I still didn't have a radio show, and you hardly heard anyone playing reggae on the radio. So if you wanted to hear the latest tunes, particularly if you lived outside of London, there was only one way. Going to a dance and following one of the dozens of sound systems which had sprung up all over the country. Every city with a West Indian community had one even Oxford. The sound system was everything and sound systems came to the UK almost uh, with the arrival of uh, Caribbean people in the Windrush era. Cox and Dodd and Duke Reed, they, they knew the secrets of, of what that original sound system culture that began on Chocomo Lawn in Kingston. They were the entertainers for that community. Sound system was the radio. So artists would do their music and the sound system would be the ones that played it for the public to hear it. There weren't any uptown clubs for people like myself to go to, so we were forced into these situations of creating our own spaces. The blues dance, the shabine comes to mind. <laughs> Blues parties, I mean, originally would be house dances. There could be someone at the door that would charge you to go in, trying to walk through, and all of a sudden, I said, don't touch my shoes, you man. You know, that would be your first thing. But then you might find a room at the back that is nice and dark and it's cool and you can get in there and there's more people congregating in there. So the kitchen would have the light and there was usually the women in the kitchen and, you know, the curry goat is going or you go and you get your, your drinks. You got sound effects going off, you got sirens going off, you know, you got traffic light systems going off. People literally brought traffic lights into the dance, <laughs> flashing away. Just like, what is going on here? The sweetness of the smells, you know, the ambience of the, you know, sacrament in the air and, um, Wow, I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it. I started going to clubs and, and, and dances and uh, I was often, you know, there were hardly any white people in there. It was a black experience. I did feel as though I was from, I was on the outside looking in and I, I could identify with it because I loved what was being said and how it was being said and, and the beautiful melodies that were created by the music and the musicians. I was fascinated by it. And I remember going to see things like Coxon and Saxon and Moambassa in places like Brixton Town Hall, for instance. And it was great, man, because it was there that we felt safe and we'd get our musical inspiration and relief from the stress of living in Babylon. Because it was dread. Trust me. You could let go, you know, without fear of, like, being scorned or looked at. Lots of fantastic dances are born out of that. You know, we're doing the basketball or we're doing all that. You know, and, and it was really, really inviting. Listening to Fat Man's Hi-Fi up in North London with Dave Henley, took me to a dance there. Um, listening to Sir Coxon, Downbeat, of course, with Festus and Blacker and the rest of the team. These were big sound systems that played in central London and travelled up to Birmingham and Manchester, so... Those were the sounds that I initially went to see. When it comes to 
being a part of the sound, it's it's a very serious thing. You know, this is my sound. I will die for this sound. I will not do any shopping this week because I've got to use the money to buy the latest music. So to identify your sound system, you, you're going to have that banner. You're going to be waving the flag. There's no sound better than your sound. Don't care how small it is or how big it is. This sound is the baddest thing. And within the sound now, you'd have a, an operator. So that's the person who operates the sound and plays the bass, plays the treble and everything. Then you have a selector in your sound. So he selects the, the tunes, tells you, right, this is what you're going to play. And then you'd have your mic man. So selector picks a tune, you put it on, and then you introduce the tune to the crowd. And then they just start playing and then they drop the bass line. It's just like, it's just great. It's a great feeling. A lot of sound system life was about status, about being a somebody in your, in your neck of the woods, in your hood. The only way you could get self-worth, the only way you could be a boss, not, there weren't many black businesses, not many people ran anything. I suppose a sound system was a way of, <laughs> you know, saying, I'm senior management, you're, you're junior management, you're the intern, you know, you're on work experience, you know, and you're a lifer, you know, you're loyal. You'll get the little watch at the end of 30 years service. It's that. It, was, it was silly, but it was important. Listening to the music played by sound systems put the whole thing in context. It was a completely different experience. But it was also where I saw how it was presented to the crowd, especially at the Notting Hill Carnival. Dad took me to the Notting Hill Carnival in 1976. <laughs> I've never seen such jubilation from my people, you know, it was just like, wow, they're just expressing themselves, you know, no one's walking down the road, like, you know. Everybody would go everywhere, you could go anywhere you wanted. If you heard a sound playing tunes and they were heavy, you block there, that's where you'd stay. The vibes and the excitement and the energy was incredible. We were actually playing at the corner of Basin Street, and Lancaster Road. We had just sung our new single, right, which was called Three Babylon, tried to make I and I run. All of a sudden, as we were starting to pack up the, the van, someone came running around Portobello Road saying, the beast them are come, the beast them are come. And the rest is history. Police were holding dustbin lids and battens and people, it was a riot. And it broke my heart. The year was 1976, and that summer was the hottest on record. But whilst the streets of London were ringing to the sounds of Jamaican music, young British reggae artists were starting to emerge. Well, I guess during that particular period, there was a message in the music, you know, and that could have been anything from Steel Pulse, you know what I mean, to even Aswad. Very, very uplifting songs just made you feel like you could walk down the street and feel good about yourself, you know what I mean? When I heard the politics in the music was actually when I heard a, a British band, most of all, that I went out and physically bought their first couple of albums, and that was Steel Pulse. <laughs> it was emotional. Being in a reggae band in the 70s and 80s was hugely political. We can't write about the Jamaican experience. We have to write about our British experience. And then we set about representing our community in Hansworth. And that's what we sought to do, to put them on the map. In 1978, I was still struggling to survive as a jobbing actor when a good friend persuaded me to audition for a job as a DJ on Radio London. I knew I had the knowledge and the enthusiasm but I thought I'd have no chance, and I was almost right. At the BBC Radio London interview, David Carter, the producer, stopped my audition after 15 minutes, and he walked into the, the other, from the master control room, he said, I'm sorry, Mr. Rodding, we've got to stop you, because there's no point in you continuing, because we are looking for a black presenter for this show, not a white presenter. And I said, I, I get that totally, and I, I uh, stood up and said, thank you very much, and I left. And I, that was the last of it. I thought I'd never hear anything back. And it transpired that they played my audition tape along with um, other black presenters to black producers and black people in the music industry. 
And according to um, the people at the BBC, uh, I was told many, many times that they had identified this voice who clearly knew what he was talking about. And I did know what I was talking about. I just happened to not be Jamaican and not be black. I had a weekly show on Radio London for almost two years. Then in 1979, I moved to Capital Radio, a far more commercial station that quickly realized the huge potential of Jamaican music. We reggae music, what the people want, and that's what they're going to get. Welcome to the first night of Roots Rockers with me, David Rodigan, and kicking us off, we had two new versions of an old Studio One rhythm. The first was recorded at Studio One in Jamaica by Sugar Minot. It's called Jar Jar Children. Taking from his brand new showcase album, and the second was from that other root singer, Karen Swing at the moment, Barrington Levi, and it's entitled Don't Fuss or Fight. You can't be doing David started doing a program on the radio, and to be honest, he got it right. He was dropping some tunes, he, he was just doing it right. If you wanted to hear reggae weekly, it was going to be. Rodigan. Good evening, David Rodigan with you tonight and a slight change of plan from the advertised programme because Bob Marley has just flown in on his way back from Zimbabwe. Bob Marley, welcome. <laughs> you were the first reggae band to really cross over into the rock world and actually stay there, but of course you've been going for years in the reggae world before that breakthrough. When did the Whalers actually come together as a singing group? The Whalers come together about 1960, you know, and the Whalers about three years. I met the first record in 1963. Carl Simmerdown. That was it. Coxon, yeah. What was it like working at Studio One? That was where you started in those days. Yeah, it was good, you know, because, you know, first experience with the music, you know, working with some good musician and trying to get the harmonies and everything. It was great. I heard you actually, you personally lived in the studio. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> you had a cox and made you a room out the back. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Looked after you and fed you. Well, you've got a new single coming out in a few weeks' time called Could You Be Loved? And we've got it here on tape. So, if everything's ready, we'll hear a bit of a sneaky preview. <laughs> playing what a sound man would play because you'd buy you buy records every week and out of the 20 records or 30 records that you have you might hear one of them on the radio but he was playing about 15 of those records that you've bought or 20. My duty my love my passion was to share new music I received some criticism in my early years because some of the sound systems um, objected to the fact that I was perhaps sometimes getting records that they weren't getting because I was as passionate about getting the music as they were. Some of the shopkeepers got annoyed as well because not all of these records were available. They were imports from Jamaica. And they said, why are you playing Jamaican imports when people can't get them? You should just be playing UK releases. So there was, I used to get a bit of stick. Um, but um, my job was primarily to share the music with like-minded people. That was, that, was my, that was my purpose. That's what I was there to do. It takes a special um, gift of being able to communicate your love of the music in a way that everyone can understand. And David can do that. There'll be little nuggets of things that he drops in that you just think, how does he know that? I just think that he really had this wealth of knowledge and experience from a different outside perspective of where, you know, we, we are so engulfed in Jamaican culture because we're Jamaicans. And, and he has such a great appreciation for it, not coming from there. And I think sometimes when you have an outside perspective, you might notice or appreciate the things that we may overlook. And I always kind of really love to hear him talk about the history of songs. Yeah, you'd whip out your C90 cassette and you'd be taping everything, every show, man. But you knew on a Saturday, David Rodigan, Match of the Day, then he went out. Or any, any of that order, that was it. This was a weekly show and people listened to it because... They cared about the music. And then there were the cassette copies that were made and sent around the world. <laughs> cassette and tape. Yeah. Our friends who still have loads of your cassettes. Loads, loads. And you cannot get it off them. I put him on a level with John Peel. And I could listen to John Peel for one reason or another. You know, he was playing punk and all the rest of it because he was different and there was something about him. Equally with Rodigan. They 
basically his radio shows were so good and then he started getting bookings to play in dances now at first we found it very very awkward because what was happening was he'd go to the dance and then they'd, they'd be going like um, yeah from the radio we have David Rodigan and the crowd would going yeah and then all of a sudden there's silence because this white guy turns up and they thought he was a black guy and it's like oh I saw people literally with someone with their mouths open aghast because they didn't realize I was white. And I remember the MC quickly said to me, you better say something and you better play a record quick because, you know. And I remember taking the mic and speaking and I actually saw some people closing their eyes as I was speaking. I'll never forget that. And I quickly went into the DJ box and I played my signature tune and the place erupted. He was different to everybody. He articulated reggae in a different way. His voice like a magnet to you, you know? His platform has meant that he's opened out Jamaican music, supported artists, um, and made it work in the UK. I mean, he's loved by so many people. We have to look at balance here as well. There are those that will challenge um, uh, David, one for his position within the Jamaican music scene, the Jamaican sound system scene, because he's a white geezer. That's it. Why can't a person love reggae? I mean, surely if, when reggae was created, it wasn't created as a something for one person or one type of person only. I mean, that would be pretty selfish, wouldn't it? If you're going to go peace and love, but you can't have one. I know I got criticism in the early years for being, you know, a white man playing black man's music. Why wasn't a black man doing it? Why was a white man doing it? As, as has often been said to me, David, you will never, ever know what it's actually like to be black. And that is a fact. For the most obvious reasons that I'm not, but also because I'm, I've immersed myself in the culture for you know the best part of 40 years, that doesn't mean that I will ever really know what it's like to be black. I don't think David has ever tried to portray anyone but himself. You know, he's never tried to act like a person of colour. He's never claimed to be a person of colour. You know what I mean? I always had the perspective of, yo, I'm a white man from England, I'm a love reggae music, and this is what, it, it captured me so much that this is what I decided to do with my life. Like all music, reggae has been through many changes, and the mid-80s saw one of the biggest and most controversial changes ever. A digital rhythm from a Casio keyboard lit up the dance halls of Jamaica and here in the UK. This was dancehall. This was a fine example of the latest sound from Jamaica, harder, flashier, and less conscious in its lyrical content. A lot of pure reggae lovers that I used to talk to hated a lot of dance or they just didn't get with dance or it's not conscious enough it's not it's, it's too bad mind it's talking about things that we shouldn't be talking about and it's too narcissistic it's this it's that you know what I mean it's too braggadocious whatever you want to call it and I just think it's a natural evolution for music to be and it, it became popular with younger people and that's the thing 1983, I went to Jamaica to record some special programs for Capital Radio. I invited the island's biggest radio DJ to be my special guest. His name, Barry G. He reciprocated by saying, listen, you're a visitor to Jamaica. Um, why don't you join me on my radio show uh, this Saturday night? And uh, he turned to me during the news. He said, why don't we do a clash? And I remember thinking, first of all, thanks for the notice. <laughs> And I remember thinking, well, why not? Won't that be amazing? Your first one, Roddy, back in the day. The Soundcast is primarily Battle of the Bands on its Battle of the DJs. Sound systems trying to outdo each other by playing more exclusive tracks than the other guy just played. There's no such thing as a playlist in a clash because you are literally bouncing off the walls and the other selectors and your competitors as to what they're playing and how you counteract it. Hey! Hey! 
Straight from London to New York City Roddy can clash with Barry Bye. That first clash with Barry G was a sensation and many more followed over the years, really increasing my profile in Jamaica. Thanks largely to cassette tape recordings, this was the beginning of a new adventure. I've been in many taxis in many Caribbean islands. You may look at where from? Ah, oh, London. Yeah, man, we know somebody in da 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 da. And then they'll go, you know Radigan? <laughs> Just always. Yeah, of course I know David Radigan, the M. You know, you get that. I was in Africa, Timbuktu, you know, in the middle of nowhere. And um, of course, they really fascinated a black woman who's not African, who's in my country. I want to know all about you. And the first thing they do is they say, are you American? No, I'm from London. Do you know David Rodigan? This happened all the time. And they'd run to a house or a hut and they'd find a well-loved cassette. They'd find this cassette, they'd bring it and they'd go, I can do swaps with you. Do you have new ones? I just made a decision. I'm not gonna kill you. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna murder you. <laughs> From the early 1990s onwards, I began to compete in sound system clashes, especially in Jamaica. You need some serious music if you're going to get through the night, and, and the, your dub plate box is all you have to rely on. Dub plates are the ammunition that sound system operators use in a sound clash. In Jamaica in the early years, in the 60s, the great sound system operators, uh, Sir Cox and Dodd, Duke Reed the Trojan, King Edwards, all the sound systems in Jamaica, they started making their own records. And what they started doing was running a copy of what they just recorded, which was a dub. And they would take those and play them on the sound systems at night. So they would get an immediate response and gauge what the response was to the audience. Eventually they were called dub plates. I don't know why, but that was the term given to them. And this is a way of having something that no other sound had. You'd go to an artist and go, right, I want you to sing this song that you've made, which is number one, with the name of my sound in it. So they go to the studio, they use the same track. Sometimes they use a different backing track. So they might use um, like an old Studio One backing track, like Real Rock, and they'll sing their tune on that rhythm. People are going, oh my God, did you hear Barry Simon sing blah, blah, blah on the Real Rock rhythm? And then it was a big thing and they killed the sound with it. Listen to this Barrington Levy. Sound killer! Sound killer! You're dead, Ricky. You're dead, Ricky. David Rodigan's strength in sound clash is that he has recorded dub plates over many years with some of the greatest Jamaican recording artists, some of whom sadly are not with us anymore. Uh, and that makes it very difficult for other sounds to, to compete with him. Idiot sound, you walk come around, Rodigan, a sound killer. Sound killer. Watching Prepare for a Clash was like pretty inspiring because you saw how seriously he took it and then it was almost like it just made complete sense when he used to win all the time because he used to spend so much time preparing for it mm -hmm. so he would all dock to the lyrics of the original song and the artist would always be like yeah that works and like yeah. deliver it perfectly <laughs> the excitement when you saw the mm -hmm. dub coming you saw him play it for the first time and you saw his face light up you knew he got the one he wanted mm -hmm. and he was going to do damage yeah, man, it's hard for the dance hall, good father. Dance fans, I know you understand. That it's something different every time you hear that again. Music House was located off the Holloway Road, and that's where we went to cut our plates. And I remember when I used to go up there, up that alleyway, there would be all these young lads hanging outside. I got to realise that I was jumping the queue, but I wasn't aware of it, because Leon or his father, Paul or Chris, Ooh. would see me and just say, come in here and cut dubs but basically what we do is we um listen to the track make sure the treble's all right make sure the bass is all right set the level make it a good level so you can play it on the record and transfer it to plate and this is a plate which is actually being cut and you'll see from the label music house that was the original music house label 
My early remembrance of David is him coming in the studio and certain man running out thinking he's immigration and people running around the place because he, they, they, they're like, who's this white man with this suit? Who is he? Who is he? I went, and he would play on it. He'll be walked down. And, who, who are you? But after they realised who it was, it, it was always love. Like He's always been a, um, just a genuine funny person when he comes into the studio. It's always, it's always a laugh. David had consistency in um, in the reggae industry as a sound man, but also as a, a radio presenter. Although I didn't own a sound, let me just qualify that. A sound man in the sense of someone who played out, but I didn't own a All sound. All right, DJ then. Yeah, DJ. All right. Selector. No, I don't even want to put it, but... No, you know what he, I mean. Yeah, but he's a sound man. He's, he's still be called as a sound man. The immediate nature of the business, it had to be now, it couldn't be tomorrow. The obsessive nature of DJs was such that they wanted to be ahead of the curve. They wanted to entertain the crowd. They wanted to have things that nobody else had. So the demand was phenomenal. <laughs> Jamaica! First superstar! Before Bob, before Peter, before Buddy, before King Yellow Man. Jamaica first superstar! From Kingston, Jamaica, Prince, Boston. No sound, Copernicus. No sound. Hey. Dropping the perfect dub plate at the right time in this musical game of chess and hearing the audience response, there really is nothing to beat it. It's incredible. I mean, Prince Buster's Hard Man for Dead is a very special dub. He also did Ghost Dance. Johnny Osborne's dub plate's playing in the ghetto tonight is a unique dub, uh, one of my most treasured possessions, along with Barrington Levy's Reggae Music, What We Want, and Prison Over Rock, the great Alton Ellis and some of the dubs he did for me. Um, there are many great dubs. Damien Marley's done some amazing dubs for me. The list is long, and it's really not how many dubs you have, but it's the quality and special quality of those dubs that make them unique. Armed with my dub plates, I've been fortunate enough to travel the world taking on sound system legends and sometimes even winning. He's clashed against the, all the top generals in the sound clash business. He's gone toe to toe them and, and held his weight. And all of the selectors would speak to him with a certain respect that they don't speak to each other, the rest of them with. You know what I'm saying? So everyone kind of have David Radigan in high regard where it come on to. So it goes without saying, he's a legend in his own right, for sure. With the passion that he's got, the love of the music, He's been able to tour the world and represent himself and represent the UK and represent the music on a global scale. So, you know, I commend him for this. Those other sounds might be there with their crews. And there's David, you know, possibly travelling on his own. And yet he still can make it work. It's that length of knowledge from Millie to where we are today that gives him the edge when he's in a sound clash. Because some youth will come up with some rhythm and it's like, okay, that's, that was a wicked rhythm in the 80s. And he's like, yeah, but what about this ver earlier version of it in the 70s? And what about, what about this one in the 60s? And he can draw a line all the way back. We've got a lot more coming. Ready, guy, you're weak now, we know. You're dead, the post, so we're Sean Paul again. Yeah, 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 yeah. It can be intimidating, for sure. Yeah, and there uh, were times when I was quite nervous out there thinking, why did I agree to do this? Must have been daunting for him to go to Jamaica and play, and play alongside some of the greatest sound systems. But he's done it, he's persevered, and have to give him, you know, have to give him props for that. Anyone that's been able to confront the Jamaican audience and get their respect, um, needs respect. A lot of DJs won't make it to, to there, to that place. I don't even think some man even want to go there, into that war. <laughs> like, like, I think you just say, you're a sound man here, in England. you don't really want to go over there and walk. When the DJ plays a killer tune, the crowd lets him know with a roar of approval, which is known as a forward. You know, there's a whole saying with Rodigan, he's a man who will get a forward from the back of the room. 
The, the, the man that's the baddest man in the dance ain't standing in the front of the dance, man. They're standing at the back of the room. You can't see them on there. They're some shady characters, you understand? <laughs> right again, he's killing out a man from the back of the dance. He's getting a forward from the back. Please give David Radigan a round of applause. Thank you, Jamaica. This is a night I will never, ever forget. I thank you for the support over the years in this land of wood and water. Thank you, Jamaica! Out in the street, they call it murder. In 2012, I left my job at KISS FM after 22 years. I return to the BBC. This is BBC Radio 1 Extra, Sunday evening, the best in reggae music. And on the show this evening? The fact that the guy's broadcasting now on the youngest station for black music in Britain, which is One Extra, the fact that One Extra wanted him, when you appeal to young people, you can appeal to a wider cross-section. That's the joy of appealing to young people, because it's entry-level for them. That's, on average, you know, 14, 15-year-olds. That's a very young audience for the BBC. But he's doing that at the same time as broadcasting for Radio 2, where the average age is 50. <laughs> How does he do that? My aim when I got onto radio was merely to play the music that I thought people would like to hear, music that I love. I then also, of course, had to realise that perhaps there would be songs that I wouldn't necessarily gravitate to, but other people did gravitate to. And I realised I had a duty as a broadcaster to be as all-encompassing as I could in terms of playing the various forms of reggae music under the banner of reggae that people would find enjoyable. People in Jamaica, they, they brought the music here with them. We didn't brought this music to, here with us. Then the younger generation would, would know about, about, about reggae music, That's you know? And we, we, we all get the love of the music. And if you notice, our children as well love the, the reggae music, you know, and always asking if we still have the records or anything, could, you know, give them. So yes, yes, reggae, reggae, you are the heart and soul of we. Um, West Indian. Mm -hmm. right. It's a Caribbean. When you play, isn't it? Yeah. And you it, can it, dance it, and... It, it's something in it that brings back memory. memory. And yes. Like you feel like you're a part of it. Young again. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I know how we do it. Red Fox! They put them knocking on their broken swing. Having a show on One Extra has meant that I've been able to introduce younger listeners to the latest sounds from Jamaica and around the world, whilst also connecting the dots to the many different types of new British music that reggae has inspired. Drum and bass, jungle, dubstep and even grind, all part of the heritage of Jamaican So I was growing up listening to ska, reggae and rock steady. They were growing up listening to MCs as us as MCs and stuff. So their music was jungle. Jungle is massive. Wick, wick it, wick it. Right? So 16 year olds and 15 year olds, that was their music. But I loved it so much because it nicked like pieces of MCs, it nicked a bit of reggae, and it had that heavy, heavy beat underneath it. I loved it. The drum and bass music would certainly not be here without the culture of, of, of reggae music and the bass line and the, and the half time and the way that we look at that whole kind of vibe. And, you know, you might be doing d and at like 160, but the, the half-time rhythm, man. There is new music being made by new producers, by new artists, and if you don't get it, it's probably not for you. They're making music for themselves and for their peer group. You go to a dance in Kingston any night of the week and hear this music being played, and you'll know this is music for young people. God, God is a next girl, God. Say she na no credit, but she na Wi-Fi spot. She can't SMS, so only can WhatsApp. KMRT, adopt me, tie back. Me know me phones. That's their music. It belongs to them. And we must respect that. Things are forever evolving. Nothing remains the same. It can't. It would be boring. I am a born a living dread. In a discatone of the living dead. For the past six years, I've run the Ram Jam stage at Parklife Festival in Manchester, named after my old record shack in Oxford Market. We invite a range of artists, both old and new, united by roots in Jamaican music. 
but with David it was clear that there was this whole new generation that he could join the dots with, you know, with jungle, with dubstep, with everything, with grime. Once you get past that initial, huh? He's a white guy that looks like a dentist playing dub plates. That Rodigan effect, I call it. He then backs it up then and then again, again and again. So, you know, he's a completely unique, one-off individual. Manchester makes a noise of Shire Fix! Welcome to the Ram Jam stage. My name is David Radigan. This year I'm celebrating 40 years playing the music I've loved all my life. If you love it like I love it, give me some signal, Manchester! If you weren't even born in 1985, give me some signal. So that means I'm going to start with some real, real old school. Tell us the hardest thing to do is to follow someone who's just ripped the place apart. So in my experience, the best thing you can do is go for a dramatic gear change. So you drop it right down in terms of pace, um, which gives the audience time to take a breath and, and, and sort of kick back a bit because Perhaps they've been going bonkers for 10 minutes. You can then begin to build again and take them on a musical journey. To see and feel the enthusiasm that they generate, if you give out the energy, you give out the love of it, you get it back tenfold. So ladies and gentlemen, about 10 years ago, my whole world changed because of one song. Are you ready? Yo, my name is Dr. David Rodig and the artist DJ the world. Hard by Breakage was without doubt the most important record for me in terms of breaking me to an audience that really didn't know about me. I remember one day um, my son saying, Dad, there's this record um, and you're on it. They've sampled you and it's blowing up. It's, it's a massive dubstep record. Him saying that it changed his life, it changed our life. Yeah as well because yeah. it grew into a month that no one knew was going to happen so it changed everyone's lives i've spent my whole life listening to you and looking at looking at you like wow rodigan and to all of a sudden you turn around and me being you know like in a club or a festival and him shouting me and me it still so spins me out a bit sequence of hot shot dub plates from now jamaica way right about now we're going to start to change the pace and change the style Oh yeah, yeah, I'm Mr. Lisa Brother J.A. Uh -huh. I read the gun now where you say, A. With David, you can see it's all about longevity. He's in it to the very end. That guy will be playing a tune when they put him six foot under. He'll be probably coming up from the coffin going, nah, wrong version, man, wrong version. Flip it over, yeah. All right, I'm back. <laughs> Hello. Oh, no. I think he will carry on playing and loving reggae music until he drops. I literally think that. If David, at 77, is still broadcasting and supporting reggae music, he will still have three generations listening to him. I think that's the appeal. Since forever. That's Rodigan. Rodigan's been here. He's, he's part of the fabric. You know, he's up there. And... You know, I suppose he's probably even surprised himself. Certainly, no, he goes home and has his lemon biscuits and cup of tea at the end of the night and thinks, oh, I'm sure he thinks, what sort of night did I just have? This is a kind of fever, this music. It's like catching a fever and there's no antidote. I've been very privileged and very fortunate to be able to, to play the music I love to like-minded souls. 